Yeah, hey there guys, uh, long time no see. Uh, that's, uh, well, that's on me, I guess. Um, yeah, well, I go through a lot of phases where I'm distracted or more interested in other things than making videos, and I'm sorry about that. Um, but, you know, I'll be back once in a while to update things and do other stuff. On the request of, um, oh, before I get started, first of all, big shout out to Gabe for this awesome Make Orwell Fiction Again t-shirt. Um, he is uh, one of my guitar students that I landed through my uh, YouTube channel. We met through my YouTube channel, and uh, he's taking lessons via Skype. And if any of you all are interested in lessons in composition or guitar via Skype, do be in touch with me. Um, but yeah, thanks, Gabe. This is very, very cool. <laughs> anyway, okay, because, uh, you know, I'm a conspiracy theorist, and I do believe we're living in an Orwellian nightmare. And in fact, I have a a theory about uh, predictive fiction such as 1984. When you read something like 1984, it's so extreme that you have to say in your mind, well, thank God we don't live under those conditions. We don't have a telescreen. We have a benign TV set, and, you know, it's not watching us, even though you know it is. In the Internet of Things, everything is watching you, including, by the way, your light bulbs are watching you. Yes, your light bulbs are watching you. Uh, the city of Los Angeles just recently gave out free light bulbs, LEDs. Now, do you know that data transmission on the wireless internet can happen through LED lights? Gee, I wonder why they gave that out for free. Anyway, that's me being totally paranoid, and I don't care because I believe in my paranoia. My paranoia is my friend. Okay, so on the request of another student, the uh, famous and infamous, uh, probably soon to be off YouTube, James Corbett, um, uh, requested that I do a video on uh, writer's block, which in the case of a musician would be composer's block. And uh, it just so happened that today I had a guitar student uh, here in Brentwood, and uh, he asked me that very question about, like, what do I do when I don't want to write? Um, now, what I came up with was um, three different approaches to deal with the situation. Uh, two are uh, polar opposites, and the third are the two combined, which I'll explain. The first uh, approach I call the Zen approach, the Eastern approach, with, which is basically don't concern yourself with it. See, the, the one destruct well, there are a couple of destructive factors in self-expression and getting your feelings or stories across through music and those two factors would be um, guilt for not doing the work and I run into this all the time as a teacher I have students cancel lessons oh I didn't practice I tell them I don't care if you didn't practice you could still learn something new if you come to the lesson so you know would you rather learn or you know it's kind of like being in a college course and you didn't do your homework one day you're not going to stop doing your college course for a bunch of weeks you just keep going until you catch up. Um, but in any case, uh, yeah, okay, so this idea is don't concern yourself with it. Don't feel guilty. And the other factor is self-consciousness, which by virtue of the phrase itself should mean something objective, like I am aware of myself. But in the sense of the um, colloquial term self-conscious, it usually means I'm shy or uh, uh, I feel like I'm under a microscope and I can't function this way. And believe me, I know that feeling over and over again I've known it, especially in the recording studio where you feel like every sound you make, you make is under a, um, under a microscope being examined. And it's this horrible feeling of like, oh, I, I don't feel, you, you don't feel natural under those circumstances. And in fact, uh, what I say about uh, performance, there's a Zen to performance, for example, um, if I'm alone here in my in my place and I'm just kind of jamming out on the guitar, I've had these moments, you know, where I, throughout the 90s I was very insecure. I didn't think I was good enough as a guitar player to really go out there and strut my stuff. Sad thing, because I was that good and I should have strutted my stuff. I'd probably be, uh, you know, a little beyond, you know, the usual uh, lack of rock stardom that I experience today. Uh, but be that as it may, I don't really care uh, about fame or money. In fact, I kind of hate money. But uh, in any case, uh, 
Uh, what was I talking about? Uh, da, 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 the Zen approach. Uh, oh yeah. So if I'm a, I, I've had this experience where I've been alone in my place and I'm I'm playing guitar and I'm just killing it. It's like wow. I wish there were a thousand people witnessing this right now to see just how good I am. Because sometimes you do feel like that. Like wow. I'm I'm pretty godlike at moments. You know. Uh, but the Zen of, of uh, well, in this case, improvisation, would be how do I take that comfortable feeling that I have when I'm alone with myself and no, no one is watching, how do I take that same exact feeling to the stage in performance in front of people or into the studio where your every little thing is being registered and recorded? Uh, that is a true art uh, and a true Zen. It's a true spiritual practice and capacity if one develops it. I am very envious of those kick-ass guitar players who can pick up a guitar cold and just start, and just start killing it. Me, I need like a long, uh, slow tra trajectory before I get to that space. Um, basically, it's what people call a warm-up is what I need. Uh, and that's what I do before a show. I'll warm up a little bit by doing uh, my famous coordination exercise that I've given to, to some of my students. All right, but we're talking about composing here. Um, now, but here's the thing. One of my sayings is composing is slow improvising and improvising is quick composing. Now, here's a question then. If I am on stage and I'm called to improvise a guitar solo, do I get to a point where I feel composer's block, where I cannot solo at all? Of course not. I, I, the, the situation demands that I do my guitar solo, okay? They, they just left a space for me in the, in the band to go ahead and, it's your turn, go ahead and improvise. So if that's the case, what is the difference? Uh, if, if composing is slow improvising and improvising is fast composing, then what's the difference here? Why don't I experience writer's block when I need to, com uh, to improvise? All right, why don't I freeze up? I mean, yeah, granted, you might have a guy who's so insecure and so self-conscious that he freezes up and can't improvise. I've seen it, but it's rare, and those people need a little bit of therapy to get past that stuff. Or they need to come to me, because I am not just a guitar teacher, but I'm also a, a Zen master and a psychotherapist. That's what I always tell my friends anyway. Because really, when you are learning an instrument, the, the, most, the biggest thing you're confronting when you learn an instrument is you yourself. You're confronting you and all your insecurities. And when it comes to the creative arts and self-expression, that's where a lot of people run up against a wall. All right, so what's the difference then? There's an urgency in the situation where I have no choice. I have to improvise. Whereas when I'm composing, well, I eh, may or may not today. I'm not so sure I want to, blah, 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 blah. So that's one of the factors is there's no urgency. There's no actual reason for you to compose. That brings me to my next point. You can't, you can, it's possible to do this. I'm sorry. Uh, but Generally speaking, beginning tabula rasa, beginning clean slate and just sitting down and saying, okay, I'm going to write a song right now, that isn't going to quite work that well. I mean, some people, some people can do it, but the problem is there is no reason for composing. It's just the only reason you have is the urgency, it's the guilt. It's like, shit, I haven't composed in so long, i got to sit down and start composing, all right? So, uh, that. Now, when it comes to the Zen thing, um, the Zen approach, which is really not caring, just letting it go. What letting it go means letting go of the guilt that you're not doing. If you don't let that go, you're screwed and you're going to be stuck with your writer's block. So you must let go of this feeling of, oh God, I'll never be a great composer because I don't have the dedication to work on it every day. And you know, all these other self-flagellating ideas that people have. Um, I had a buddy who, um, who once said, <laughs> he was a good buddy of mine. He wasn't the smartest guy in the world, but he once, he once said something to me that was very, very wise. He said to me, you know, if somebody in the world came up to you 
and talk to you the way you talk to yourself, the way you, in the privacy of your own mind, say, oh, God, I suck, and blah, 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 right? If somebody came up to you and spoke to you that way, to you, you'd probably haul off and punch them for being such an asshole to you. But yet we allow ourselves to totally flagellate ourselves and tell ourselves how bad we are. So there's a kind of irony in that, you know? So, again, it's this guilt of not, so letting go simply means letting go of the guilt and just living. Now, you might say, well, then I'll just be going through life and I'll, I'll never compose again because I've let it go. That's not the case because, see, there's a, an original uh, spark inside of you. It, it may be burning with a small flame, but it is always there and it needs something to ignite it, okay? So when you are going about your life, uh, doing whatever you do, and that if you truly let go, but you know that deep inside of you is a composer that wants to come out, right? It's just that desire alone is the necessity. If you have the desire and the emptiness, the letting go, all right, you'll one day run into a situation where you're talking to some, someone or hearing something on the radio or whatever the case may be that makes you go, oh, that would be a great song. It could be, say, a title, you know, just like a random sequence of words. It sounds like it'd be an awesome song title. And what could I write from this, okay? So that sort of thing. The spark is within you, and it will come out, all right? Um, I'm a big proponent of this. I really do believe, uh, to give an example, uh, actually, I'll give that example later when I combine the approaches. Now, the other approach, the flip side, the yin-yang, the yang to the yin, and the, the Zen approach is yin, it's passive, okay? But the yang approach is the Western approach, which is let's bulldoze the mofo, okay? So um, now, years and years ago, I was an avid songwriter, and uh, uh, I used to work on, you know, some song every day. And uh, when I say songwriter, I don't mean pure music composer. I mean lyrics and like singer-songwriter stuff. I was heavily inspired by the Beatles, of course, and uh, I wanted to reach their heights, which sadly I never did. But in any case, um, I was seeing at the time, I was about 21 years old, and I was seeing a therapist, because uh, I was really, I was really screwed up. And I still am in some respects, but happy about it. Um, any case, um, the steamroller approach, I, uh, basically I talked to this therapist and I said, I'm having a problem. I, I'd been writing songs, they've been streaming out of me, and now every time I sit down to write, I can't get anything happening. And I suppose this was worth the price of admission for this therapist. He didn't hear, help me with my neurosis, but he certainly helped in this one little area. He said to me, you know, I'm a writer, not a music writer, but a... I write uh, expository material and stories and stuff like that. And he goes, I have, I've had the same problem. And he goes, my solution to it was this. And I want you to think about this if you've run into the composer's block. Can you allow yourself 10 minutes uh, twice a week, say on Tuesdays and Thursdays, at whenever you know you're going to be free, let's say uh, 7 o'clock p.m., 10 minutes to try to write something. Now, mind you, this is the bulldozer approach, so you've got to try to squeeze something out of your brain, all right? So uh, if you do this, you know, I, I took this guy's advice. I, I allotted myself two days a week, 10 minutes at a, sh at a pop, and what ensued was remarkable, nothing short of remarkable. I do the 10 minutes, but I, I hooked on to something that I liked, and I couldn't stop at that point. I didn't want to stop. So, you know, I just need a few more minutes to work on this. Turns into 15, half hour, hour, two hours later, and I've got mm, good rough songs sculpted at that point, which, you know, then I could work on the next day and, and finish up. So uh, that's, that's the, the bulldozer approach. Now, when you take the bulldozer approach, again, you can't start from tabula rasa. You can't start with nothing and say, I'm going to make a song. I mean, yes, like I said, it is possible. But you need a something, okay? Now, I would imagine that if you sit down to write, uh, to compose a song, I would imagine that you take the same approach every time. And the trick here is to take a fresh, new, different perspective. An example I like to give is, um, 
I, you know, it's my belief that a song like uh, by the police, every little thing she does is magic. I have a tendency to believe that Sting sat down with his bass guitar and played the bass line, da, 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 and began to sing against that. All right, so he took the approach of, I'm going to start with a bass line and compose a melody over that. All right, so I bet you never tried that. I did. I did. I wrote, I wrote a really cool song called A Time for Miracles based on a bass line. I love the bass line, and that triggered the rest of the song. In fact, it took me about a good five years before I found the right lyrics for the song. And I'm so glad I waited because um, I wanted, uh, initially I wanted the imagery. At the time, Haley's Comet was coming around. And uh, it was originally like about Haley's Comet coming around. It was called Waiting for Haley's Comet, which was kind of ridiculous. Um, I forgot what it morphed into. Uh, oh, Watching the Stars and Planets. It was kind of space oriented. And then I finally let that go and turned it into more of a uh, song about my own personal longings never getting um, fulfilled. It was called A Time for Miracles, and I think the, the lyrical set there is just it's one, of, one of my better sets of lyrics. I really like it. Um, so there I started again from a, ba uh, a bass line and then uh, got the chords and the melody, but it took me years to get the lyrics, which I finally got. Okay, so that's a new approach. Start with a bass line. Uh, another approach is have you written a set of lyrics first before you set it to music? All right. Uh, during this phase that I'd seen this therapist, I had a buddy that I had had, uh, I was in a band with in high school. And this guy was kind of a, an intellectual and on the cutting edge of the arts and nothing was really cool unless it was on the cutting edge. Oh, the rest was just garbage to him. So he had already passed by his Beatles phase and he was listening to stuff like bands like television and uh, talking heads and that was all new to me, and I, I didn't quite get it yet until I heard Elvis Costello. He was the one that turned me on to this whole new music that was happening in the 70s, late 70s. And uh, that was the trigger that, that happened. But before then, uh, you know, he was off at college or something, and I was writing songs, and I sent him these tapes of things that I've written, and he was just merciless. He had these scathing reviews of all of my songs, and granted, I was still influenced by the Beatles, and a lot of my stuff sounded like cutesy Paul McCartney crap, which uh, some of this stuff really was. So, uh, um, one day I decided, uh, it was very interesting what happened, I decided I was going to take a different approach, and I started with lyrics. And uh, the song was extremely emotional, and it, I, because I started with lyrics, I was, I was gearing the music toward the, the phrasing of the, uh, of the words and also the emotional content of the words I was trying to bring about in the chord progression and the melody I was working on. Uh, I wound up sending that song to him and he loved it. It was like, it was a totally different song for me to write, but uh, I think it was just the constant, um, his constant disapproval of everything I was writing, um, I was trying to get his message, like, what are you telling me? Like, what are you telling Why is this so bad? Why, why don't you like it? And then what I realized was that rock and roll back in the late 70s was coming back to rock and roll. It was getting past the, the glitz and the glam and, and all the, uh, you know, uh, what they call prog rock and southern rock and all those really boring forms into raw rock and roll again and I only got it when I started getting it when I wrote the song and it was there's a kind of wailing feeling to the song so um, point being with all this you know start with a bass line see if you can do it that way write lyrics first instead of chords there are a multitude of things you can do uh, to approach writing a song in a different way uh, I'll give you you know okay when you see when you have tabula rasa situation you're unlimited anything is possible you could do anything right now when you look at uh, the music the classical music of at the turn of the century you had people like igor stravinsky and arnold schoenberg and Ar arnold schoenberg developed a definitive system for creating atonal music which is music without a root uh, music without a root has a tendency to sound uber dissonant 
And uh, Stravinsky, although he experimented with that, he also uh, was experimenting with harmony itself and, and staying tonal at times too. So one thing Igor Stravinsky would do before he set out to compose was to write out a set of rules that the composition had to uh, meet. The composition had to abide by these rules and stay within them. Uh, one of his rules, for example, was instead of a dissonant chord resolving to a consonant chord, he decided, well, why just be a chord to a chord? Why not a full 16 bars of dissonance resolving, you know, with a whole bunch of chords, resolving to 16 bars of consonance with nice, you know, standard Western harmony chords, okay? So that was one of his rules, which I think he employed in, I think it might have been Petrushka. I don't remember what piece it was. Um, but this is one of my points that limitation fosters creativity. When you're unlimited, the tendency is like, well, I could do anything, so what do I do? I'm overwhelmed with possibilities. Let me give you a real world example. Um, when I was fiddling with digital equipment, you could see my uh, early loops from the, uh, from the early 2000s when I had was using digital effects and a high-tech looper and just doing all this kind of crazy psychedelic stuff. Um, I, my effects unit could model amp, different amplifiers, a Fender Twin, a Marshall, you know, a Vox amp, all the different amplifiers. It had all different kinds of distortions, what type, you know, uh, um, ranging from a fuzz box to uh, a big muff to all the different styles of stomp boxes. It would even model the pickups I was using and the kind of guitar I was using. Even though I'd be using this kind of guitar, I could dial it in to sound like that kind of guitar. And even a crazy thing like pickup placement, you could literally place the pickup somewhere on the neck. It was, you know, virtual. So, But the problem with all that was that I needed to simplify. There were too many options. It was like, what am I going for? My actual guitar tone? the tone that's coming out of my amp or the tones that are being generated by my digital effects box. Another example would be contemporary uh, composition where you have up to 256 possible tracks, if not more, that you can uh, put layers on in contemporary recording. Um, again, there's every possibility. They have plugins where you could emulate this kind of compressor and that kind of delay and this kind of that and that, 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 that. Now, when you look at limitation in comparison, where you don't have all of that stuff, go back to the early Beatles, okay? The early Beatles only had some guitars, amplifiers, and tape recorded. Uh, it took them time to realize the limitations they had. It inspired them to break through the very limitations. So, ex for example, tape recording. Well, there's not much you could do with that compared to digital recording where you could cut and paste and move things around. It's not that simple with uh, magnetic tape. But the Beatles uh, figured out ways to use magnetic tape that expanded their music. And in fact, their limitation inspired them, okay? The more you limit someone, the more creative they can get. If you put someone in jail, they're gonna think creatively of how to get out, okay? Um, if you're already out, then you're out, all right? There's nothing you need to do. That's the tabula rasa situation where uh, every possibility is available. And, and as a result, you're overwhelmed because anything, you could do anything, so where do I start, okay? That's why I like Stravinsky's idea of creating a, a set of limitations to begin. All right, uh, I remember um, jamming with a buddy of mine. I was in my teens and we were doing a blues and I was playing like a walking bass line and I kind of created a rule for that jam. It was, we were purposely doing atonal, like really out there, but it had to sound kind of like a blues progression. So what I did was whenever the chord would change from the one chord to the four chord or to the five chord, I would hit the root in the moment that it would come in, but then I'd hit any other note in afterward. All right, so I'd do a walking bass root, da 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 da, root da ba 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 ba. So it had this obtuse sound, but it still suggested the blues. It was a very creative moment and a lot of fun. I doubt if it was very musical sounding. 
Now, I'm going to talk about, it, if you've gotten that, if you understand the idea of, of the steamroller approach, forcing yourself to do it, rely on perspective change, on creating a limitation for yourself. That's actually the whole idea of giving yourself 10 minutes on two days a week is a limitation right there. Within 10 minutes, I have to come up with something. That limitation will help you. Uh, I don't know if I already said it, but yeah, yeah, it, it, that helped me a whole bunch. That really helped me a whole bunch. Now, what is the combined approach? Uh, I've seen this happen over and over again with my guitar students where they're learning a new operation on the guitar and they practice and practice really hard. They're just like deep into it, just doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it. And then they come to the lesson and they're totally screwing up what they practiced. So I tell them, let it go and do something else. Don't even practice that anymore. Forget it. Put it, put it somewhere else. Put, your, put it out of your mind. 90% of the times they come back two weeks later and they're nailing it. Now, why is that? I have a theory, our brains are remarkable, and I have a theory that when you get frustrated and just can't deal anymore with practicing or whatever, it's your brain telling you through emotions, right? It's, let's say the only way the brain could talk to you is through your feelings, and that might possibly be true. It's telling you through your emotions, leave me alone and let me work on this without you butting in. All right. So basically, point being, you're going to work on it on an unconscious level, effortlessly, without thinking. Now, is this a real, a reality? I would say it is. And in fact, many, many composers have had this. I'm going to give you the story of Nowhere Man by John Lennon, which is a gorgeous piece of music. It was groundbreaking in many ways. It was one of the first Beatles songs to set the draw a line between them and us, which was a big thing in those days, you know, the establishment versus us woke people. Um, he was working all day to write a song, probably from that tabula rasa viewpoint, and uh, he just became so frustrated, got pissed off and, and put his guitar down and said, screw this, I'm taking a nap. As he awoke, the melody and lyrics to Nowhere Man started flowing through his mind. He picked up his guitar and effortlessly wrote the song. This has also happened to Paul McCartney. That happened with the song yesterday. When you squeeze your brain for ideas, right, you're just kind of wringing it out and trying to get something out of it, eventually you say, your brain goes, enough. And how it says enough is by making you feel frustration, uh, exasperation, all those negative feelings. That's only your brain saying, Please leave me alone to do this, okay? Uh, a real world example of that, in a sense, is I was a songwriting partner with this wonderful composer by the name of Larry Lang, really gifted uh, composer. And, uh, but I had like a lot more of the chord knowledge and music theory when we wrote together. And I remember we were writing a song together and we were stuck for a bridge. So he says to me, Vinny, I have to take a pee. Um, I'll be right back. And while he was gone, I started working out this thing. And by the time he was back, I had this beautiful, it was a very nice chord set that just fit perfectly with what we were doing. Um, I'm actually very proud of that. So in a sense, I was the brain and he left me alone to work it out on my own. Um, so really take that seriously. I've seen this happen. It's a remarkable phenomenon. I've seen it happen over and over again. Your unconscious mind is incredibly powerful and could do amazing things. Um, and I guess that's about it. That's the, com uh, the combined approach is work, 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 steamroller, 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 let it go, and then the Zen approach happens. Um, you're hearing birds chirping right now. That's actually my ringtone, and I'm not going to answer it. And I don't want to be rude to you guys. So, uh, in any case, uh, so that's it. That's it for today, I think, uh, how to get past composer's block. Um, if you like this video, please hit the like button or whatever and whatever. If you'd like to uh, donate to my cause, you can, uh, you don't have to have a PayPal account, uh, www.paypal.me, as in me forward slash vincognito if you'd like to contribute to my cause. I don't blame you if you don't because I'm hardly putting out videos on a, on a frequent basis. Uh, and besides, you know, it's all good.
Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Have a great day and take care.